Thank you for coming along. Um, so I want to talk about user namespaces, which essentially are one of the key building blocks of containers and, and a lot of other interesting technology. Um, good, my device is going to work. Just a little bit about myself. I'm the maintainer of the Linux Manual Pages project. Um, this is the manual pages that provide Section 2 and Section 3 manual pages, system calls, library functions. I've been doing that for a while. I regret that I can't be in the other talk right now because it's a documentation talk. <laughs> um, I wrote a book. Um, maybe some of you have come across it. Uh, and my day job these days is mostly doing training, but this, by background, I'm a programmer. Okay, when I do this sort of topic in a training course, I would normally spend several hours on it. So I'm going to do things obviously in a lot less time. I'm going to skip some stuff. I'm going to go a bit fast. I'm going to say save the questions till the end. Sometimes in talks I take questions in the middle, but um, I need to keep, keep going. Before I start talking about namespaces, though, or user namespaces in particular, I need to introduce another topic very briefly, which is capabilities. And capabilities on Linux are about solving a certain problem. And the problem goes like this. The traditional Unix privilege model divides users, divides processes into two categories. There's normal users, unprivileged users, unprivileged processes that are subject to a lot of permissions checks on a Unix system. And then the super user who can bypass all of these checks, or at least most checks. So we've got this very um, granular privilege model, two, two classes of users, and, and the way Traditionally on Unix systems that you allow a program to operate with privilege, operate with super user privilege, is you make it a set user ID root program. You change its ownership to root and you turn on the set user ID bit using those shell commands that um, I'm, I'm showing just there. And then when some process executes that program, the effective user ID of the process changes to be the same as the owner of the program, which in this case is super user. So now the process has the power of super user. Now this is obviously very powerful. It's also, of course, very dangerous because if the process can get compromised, then it can do all the bad things that super user can do. So this is the problem with the Unix, traditional Unix um, privilege model. There's, there's this very rough granularity of, of, of the privilege model. Either you're unprivileged or you have all privileges. There's, there's not something in between. And this is, what, whoops, this is why capabilities were invented as an idea. The idea is let's have something in between. And the idea is let's break the power of soup user into small pieces. Now, as things stand in, the, in current kernels, there are 38 of these small pieces. The list has slowly grown over the years, um, but there hasn't been a new capability added for, I think, about mm, probably at least five years now. So at the moment, we have 38 of, of these capabilities. And the idea is each one of them should let you do some small set of the special things that a tr traditional super user can do. So a, a few examples here. Um, cap DAC override lets, lets the process bypass file permissions, read and write any file on the system. Um, cap sys time lets a process change the system clock. Cap sys admin sadly lets you do way too many things, but that's the story for another talk. Um, so now the idea is instead of having a set user ID root program, we can have a program that just has a certain capability or perhaps a few capabilities attached. And when the process executes that program, then it gets just those capabilities instead of getting the full power of super user, which is what you would get with a set user ID root program. And the idea then is that if this program gets compromised, because the process that is running it has 
a subset of the power of super user, then maybe the damage that the attacker can do is, is less, okay? Because the program is less powerful. So we've got, a, we've got then this, the concept of binaries that have capabilities as being less dangerous than set user ID root binaries. So then, just to, sub, to, just to sort of summarize, we've got the concept that processes can have capabilities, some subset of the power of root. We've got the concept that files can have capabilities, and the idea is that if a process executes the file, then the file gives those capabilities to the process, and the idea is now that we can have privileged processes, privileged binaries that are less dangerous than traditional root processes or set user ID root binaries. So let's talk about namespaces. Okay, so what is a namespace? It's really hard to define this in some simple sentence. You'll see something like this um, as an attempt to summarize what a, a namespace is. It's, it's a mechanism to wrap some global resource in a way that provides isolation. Now, I'll unpack what that means with a, an example or two as we go. The, the, whoop, my clicker is a little bit oversensitive. Um, Linux currently supports seven different types of namespaces. This, this list has been slowly growing over time, and it's likely to grow again in the next year or two, I expect, because there's been conversations about a, a couple of new namespace types just lately. But what we, what we currently have is um, these seven mount namespaces. And I've got them listed here just in the order they were added to the kernel. So the first one was added back in 2002, mount namespaces. The idea of mount namespaces is you can have a group of processes that are in a mount namespace. They see a certain set of mount points, a certain arrangement of the single directory hierarchy. Whereas you might have processes that are in another mount namespace, they see a different set of mount points a completely different arrangement of the single directory hierarchy. Putting this in container terms, this means that your different containers could see different sets of file systems, different sets of mount points. We've got UTS namespaces. What these do, and I'll look at these again in a bit more detail in just a moment, um, isolate a couple of system identifiers. In particular, they isolate the host name. So you have processes that are in one UTS namespace that see a certain host name, processes that are in a different UTS namespace, they see a different host name. Um, there's a few other namespaces. I don't want to try and go into the details of IPC namespaces, but the isolation that's being provided there is for certain kinds of IPC objects. PID namespaces, what's being isolated here is the process ID number space. This means you can have, from the point of view of containers, a set of PIDs inside a container that are visible only inside the container and not visible in other containers. This means you can have, for example, PID1 in each one of your containers. And PID1, of course, is the special init process that does many things on a system, including inside a container. Network namespaces are about isolating um, network resources, um, network devices, um, socket port number space, um, uh, various files and slash proc and slash sys. And the idea here is that with your containers, each container can have its own virtual networking devices and its own port number space. So that each one of your containers, for example, you could run a, a web server on port 80. And this works because each container has its own private set of port numbers and its own private virtual networking device. Whoops. Um, life got really interesting with user namespaces, which is what I'm going to spend some time talking about, it, which were essentially reached a milestone of maturity about five, six years ago now. And what's being isolated here is user IDs and group IDs. And I'll come back to what that means soon. And then the, 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 the most recently added namespace, which I don't really want to try and explain at all because then I'd need to explain what C groups are, is uh, C group namespaces. All I'll say about C group namespaces is once you understand what C groups are, C group namespaces are super simple. It's, there's nothing complicated here. C groups themselves are quite complicated, but C group namespaces are super simple. Now, how does this then work? 
The idea is we've got seven different types of namespace currently, and for each one of those different namespace types, there can be multiple instances of the namespace on the system. To begin with, when the system is booted up, there's one instance of each namespace type. And this, this first instance is called the initial namespace. And the idea is that every process on the system resides in exactly one instance of each namespace type. So there are currently seven namespace types. Each process on, the, on a Linux system resides in one instance of each of those seven namespaces. And the idea is that for the processes that are in a particular instance of a particular namespace type, they see a certain view of some global resource. That global resource is private to them. If one of those processes changes the global resource, that change is visible to the other processes that are in the namespace instance, but it's not visible to processes that are in other instances of that namespace type. And when a new process gets created, it begins its life in the same namespaces as its parent. Now, this is kind of abstract, so um, let's, let's try and make this more concrete. It makes it more understandable. And UTS namespaces are a good example because they're relatively simple. What's being isolated by UTS namespaces is a couple of system identifiers, including the host name. Now, the host name is the, the identifier that you can see with the uname command or with the host name command, and that you can change with the host name command uh, as well. And of course, there are system calls underneath for doing these operations. Now, on any particular system, there might be multiple UTS namespace instances. Processes that are in one particular instance see a certain host name. If one of those processes in a certain instance changes the host name, the change is visible to all the other processes that are in the same UTS namespace instance, but the changes aren't visible to processes in other UTS namespaces that see their own host name, the host name that corresponds to their namespace. So we've got a situation like this, where we've got, in this case, three different UTS namespaces. We've got some processes in each namespace, uh, the circles, and each one of those processes in a particular namespace is seeing a particular host name. Okay, so the processes that are here in, um, say, this namespace here, are seeing a certain host name, Tekapo. If one of those processes changes the host name, that change will be visible to the other processes inside the same namespace instance, but for example, the change won't have any effect in the other two namespace instances, which see their own namespace, um, uh, sorry, their own host names corresponding to their own UTS namespace instance. Okay, now there's some there's some system calls underneath all of this. There's some commands for working with namespaces. I just want to briefly run through these uh, in preparation for doing a, a, a demo or two. So, but first of all, in the proc directory, in the um, I'll rephrase that. In the proc directory, we have proc pid files that have information about each process. Inside each one of these proc pid directories. There's a subdirectory called ns, and inside that subdirectory, there's a bunch of symbolic links. And these symbolic links, you can see from the names there, they correspond to the seven different types of namespace. And so each process has these seven sim links in this proc pid ns um, um, directory, and these sim links serve a number of purposes. Um, First of all, the sim links, you can read them. So if we use the read link command, for instance, or alias-l for that matter, we see the sim links, they have a certain value. Now, normally the value of a sim link is, is, is something like a path name. But the value of these sim links, and these are magic sim links that are created in the proc file system on the fly by the kernel, the values of these sim links are certain specially constructed strings. And the strings look like a name, some namespace, the name of some namespace, a colon, and then in square brackets, uh, a magic inode number. And the idea is 
that if you have two processes that are in the same namespace, then if you look at that PROC PID NS symlink, you'll see the same number. So one of the purposes of these files is to answer the question, are these two processes in the same namespace instance or not? Okay, now I mentioned there are some system calls that make all this stuff work. Um, I don't want to go into the details of these system calls, but just to mention what there is, there's the clone system call. Clone does many things. Essentially, it creates a new process, but what you can do with clone as well is say, that new process should be in some new namespaces. So you can create some new namespaces at the same time. There's unshare. Unshare just said, well, unshare again does many things, but one of the things you can say with unshare is, I want to create some new namespaces. And you say what kinds of namespaces you want to create. And unshare, one of the effects of unshare is the calling process gets moved into the new namespaces. And then there's set in S, which allows a process to change its own namespace membership to move into a different namespace. Now, I don't want to go into the details of, details of those system calls, but what we have layered on top of these system calls are some useful commands for doing demonstrations. There's the unshare command, which un underneath is using the unshare system call, and the nsenter command, which underneath is using the setns system call to allow you to move into an existing namespace. Okay, these commands, they have options that enable you to say what kind of namespaces do you want to deal with. So with unshare, you can say you want to create a new C group namespace or a new user namespace. The, the seven different types of namespaces. And again, with nsenter, you can say, I want to move into an existing namespace. The way you identify the existing namespace is with this uh, a combination, first of all, well, there's a few ways of doing it, but one way is to say, I want to move into the namespace of a certain existing process. So you say, target PID. And then you might turn around and say, well, for that process, I want to move into the user namespace of that process. So you'd use dash T PID and dash U. Okay, and you'll see the option there is on the two commands, they correspond. Now, in order to create namespaces, you need to have privileges. More specifically, you need to have capabilities. Except for user namespaces. To create user namespaces, you don't need any privileges. But to create all the other kinds of namespaces, you need to have a capability, Capsys Admin, one of those 38 capabilities. Whoops. Okay, so let's just try this out. Oops. Okay. Just make sure I'm in the right place. Okay. So what I'm going to do um, up here. I'm going to say, I, first of all, I've got a couple of shells here. These shells are in the initial UTS namespace. And what I'm going to do is read link of proc slash dollar dollar PID of the shell NS UTS. I see a certain magic number there. Just to verify that these two shells really are in the same UTS namespace. I'll do the same. I hate that. <laughs> OK. So you see the same two numbers there. These processes really are in the same UTS namespace. Now, what I'm going to do up here in the top window is, first of all, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I've got a big screen. OK. Up here, I'm going to say, run the unshare command, and I'm going to say, create a new UTS namespace. That's the dash capital U option. And then I specify a command I want to run in that new namespace. Now, because this is one of the other kinds of namespace, not a, not a user namespace, I need to do this with privilege. So what I'm going to do is say, sudo, 
Okay. Now, I'm going to run that read link command again. I don't learn from experience. Okay, we see... Uh, oh, I used the wrong letter. <laughs> Excuse me. I should have used lowercase u. <laughs> Uppercase u is user namespaces, lowercase u is UTS namespaces. Let's try that again. Now, relink slash proc dollar dollar ns <laughs> okay, we see a different number. These, this, this new shell is in a new UTS namespace. Okay, now, um, what I should have done down in the um, original shell, in the original UTS namespace, let's just look at the host name. I've got a certain host name there. Now, let's look at the host name up here in the new UTS namespace. Okay, it's also BN because um, to begin with, the, the new UTS namespace inherits the host name uh, of the process that created this UTS namespace. So the, the creating process was in a certain UTS namespace. The new UTS namespace inherits the same host name. But what I can now do is turn around and say, change that host name. And now, the host name's different, and then down here, just to verify, okay, host name down there is still BN. Okay, so we've got two different UTS namespaces. They're isolating the host name here, and we can have different host names. Okay, and of course, in container terms, that means our containers could have different host names. Now, what I could then do is say, let's find out the actual PID of that shell. And then down here, I could say sudo nsenter dash t. I want to go into the namespace of the target process with PID 7833. And I want to go into the UTS namespace of that process. OK. So now I'm inside that new, uh, no, well, in theory at least, I'm in the new UTS namespace. And now when I type hostname, we hope that I'm going to see something different. And luckily for me, we do. All good so far? OK. Right. OK, so that's namespaces very briefly. Let's now look at user namespaces. Now, the <coughs> excuse me. The idea with user namespaces is that you can isolate user IDs and group IDs. What, what this really means is you can have user IDs inside the user namespace that map to different user IDs outside the namespace, and the same thing with group IDs. And the interesting use case here, or the interesting case here, is you can have a process that has UID 0 inside the user namespace, but it has an unprivileged user ID outside the namespace. And what that means is this process has super user powers inside the user namespace. And I'm working towards explaining what actually that means. Okay, but the point is, this process has the powers of superuser in some sense. Okay, now, user namespaces have hierarchical relationships. What I'm trying to say there is each user namespace has a parent user namespace, which has a parent user namespace, which has a parent user namespace, and so on, going back to the initial user namespace. The way that this relationship gets created is when a new user namespace is created, the parent of that new user namespace is the user namespace of the process that created the new user namespace. That's how that parental relationship gets established. 
Um, and, and the reason that this parental relationship matters is it, it's part of answering the question of how do capabilities work inside um, uh, username spaces. And I'm probably not going to get time to go into those details, but I do have some end slides um, after the presentation that you could look at if you want to to, to, to to learn about those rules. But the point is this hierarchical relationship is part of determining how capabilities work. So we've got this sort of situation in this picture then, where we have namespaces that have child namespaces, which have child namespaces, and so on. So we've got a hierarchy. Okay, now, when a new user namespace is created, using, say, the unshare command, then the first process in that namespace has a full set of capabilities. It is super user, so to speak, in that new user namespace, but, but only inside that user namespace. Okay, and so what does that mean? Um, well, we know there are a bunch of different namespace types, and each one of those namespace types governs some kind of resource. UTS namespaces govern host names. Mount namespaces govern mount points. Network namespaces govern network resources, and so on. What we're going to see is a few more pieces, that each one of these non-user namespaces, oh, sorry, I'll rephrase that. Each one of these non-user namespace instances is owned by a particular user namespace instance. So every non-user namespace belongs to some user namespace. And being super user inside a user namespace means you can do super user operations on the resources that are governed by the non-user namespaces that are owned by that user namespace. I've got a picture coming up later on that'll make this idea clearer, I hope. Now, one of the things that you do when you create user namespaces is you have to set up user ID and group ID mappings. And the idea is here what you're saying is that a certain set of user IDs or group IDs inside the namespace maps to some other set of name, user IDs and group IDs outside the namespace. And the way that this, these mappings are set up is you, you, you can write, and you can also read these files, by the way, but initially you have to write them to actually define the mappings. PROC PID UID map and PROC PID GID map. They ref respectively define the user, map, user ID mappings and the group ID mappings. Um, every process has these files. Of course, if you've got multiple processes that are in the same user namespace, all these files are doing is providing a view of the same UID map or the same group ID map. There is only one UID map or group ID map per user namespace. Now, for, for a lot of security reasons, there are a heap of rules about how you update these files, and I can't possibly go into all those rules right now. I just want to say there are a lot of rules saying how you update those files, and you can go and look in the user namespaces manual page to, to find out about those rules. But essentially, the files consist of records that look like this. Three numbers, an ID inside the namespace maps to some ID outside the namespace, and then a range of that mapping. And the range says you know, how, how many consecutive IDs should be mapped. So you could have a mapping that says something like 0, 1000, 10, and that would be saying the IDs from 0 through to 9 inside the namespace map to 1000 through to 1009 outside the namespace. Or a quite common mapping to see in, 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 um, in many instances is what's called the root mapping. And the root mapping says UID 0 inside this namespace maps to some unprivileged ID, maybe 1000 for example, outside the namespace, and the range of the mapping is 1. So only a single user ID is mapped, okay, rather than a, 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 a range. Now, you can create 
uh, a username space with the root mapping. You say unshare dash u username space uh, dash r to say I want the root mappings. And if I do that from the shell and then look at what I've got, I'll see something like this, where um, I, first of all, I've done this as an unprivileged user, user ID 1000. And then I've said create a uh, username space unshare dash capital U dash R and just just to make things a bit easier to understand I've given the new shell a different prompt okay so that in the subsequent slides you can see when I'm talking about this new shell okay now I inside that new shell I then turn around and look at the UID map and the GID map that have been created for me and I see I've got the root mapping zero inside the namespace uh, zero, zero, UID zero inside the namespace maps to 1,000 outside the namespace, and the range of the mapping is one. And the same thing for the GID map. If I then turn around and look at the um, credentials of that process uh, if, from inside the shell, so if the sh if from the shell we look at the credentials of that shell, I use the ID command, I see that the shell has UID zero GID zero. And if I look in the proc PID status file, one of the things I can do with the proc PID status file is find out the process's capabilities. Okay, proc PID status has a lot of information about processes, including a bunch of fields that tell us what are the process's capabilities. And what I'm seeing here is this process has a set of effective capabilities expressed as a hexadecimal bit mask. There's nine Fs there plus three, that's 38 one bits. This process has all capabilities. Now, um, what I then want to do is look at the, um, the, 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 the PID of that new shell. It's got a certain PID. And then from a shell in the initial username space, I go and look at the credentials of that of that process. Now, from the process that's in the initial username space, which is the parent of the new username space, I see a different picture. From this username space, the process looks like it has credentials 1000. Okay? Because outside the username space, in the parent username space, zero mapped to 1000. Okay. Now, um, if we go back to the shell in the um, initial, sorry, in the second username space, we might say, hey, I've got all the capabilities. Maybe I can change the host name. But if I try and do that, I get an error. Okay? You need to be root to change the host name. But, you know, we had UID 0. We had the required capability, which is, by the way, sadly, CAPS is admin. But that's another story for another talk. Um, the thing is, though, this shell isn't a new username space, but it's still in the initial UTS namespace. OK, and UTS namespaces are what govern the host name. So let's, let's go and look at that situation a bit more closely. So I said that when a new process is created in a new username space, that first process gets a full set of capabilities, but those capabilities only apply for resources that are governed by the username space. And I mentioned this idea before that each um, non-username space is owned by some username space. And the idea is that when a non-username space is created, it's owned by the username space of the process that created the new non-user namespace. And the idea is then that if a process tries to do operations on some resource that requires privilege, the kernel asks, well, which, which, which namespace governs that resource? And then which user namespace owns that that username space. So to make this concrete with an example, let's look at this setup. I've got a command here. I'm going to use unshare dash u, capital U, create a new username space with root mappings. That's the dash r. And then dash u at the same time, 
create a new UTS namespace. And I'm going to run some program. I don't care what the program is. If I do that, I end up in a situation like this. We've got some, we've got some user namespaces and we've got some non-user namespaces. Now, to begin with, before we did anything, there was the initial user namespace. The initial user namespace, that was created at boot time. Um, and as well, at boot time, whoops, excuse me, there were a number of non-initial uh, namespaces created. There was an initial UTS namespace, an initial network namespace, an initial mount namespace, an initial IPC namespace, an initial C group namespace, and so on. Those six other namespace types, there were initial instances of those namespace types, and they were all owned by the initial user namespace. Now, when I ran my shell command to create a new user namespace, what that did was create a new user namespace here. I did this as user ID 1000, so the new user namespace is owned by user ID 1000, and it's a child of the initial user namespace because that's how things work. When a new user namespace is created, its parent is the user namespace of the process that created the new user namespace. And at the same time I created the new user namespace, I also said, I want to create a new UTS namespace. And because I did this at the same time, that new UTS namespace is owned by the new user namespace. Now, then I've got my process that I created, X, whatever, some program I ran. Now, that process, because I, created it with, because I created the user namespace with root mappings, that process has an effective user ID of zero inside the namespace, but outside the namespace, the effective user ID mapped to some unprivileged user ID, in my case, 1,000, and this process has all capabilities. And that's what this notation equals EP says. This process has all permitted and effective capabilities. Now, Whoops. Now, suppose this process X tried to change the host name. To change the host name, you need to have a certain capability. And in order to change the host name, when this process tries to change the host name, the kernel says, well, host names are governed by UTS namespaces. Which UTS namespace is this process a member of? And the answer is, it's a member of this UTS namespace. And then the kernel says, well, which UTS namespace owns, sorry, which user namespace owns this UTS namespace? And the answer is this one. And then the kernel's question is, well, what capabilities does this process have in that user namespace? And the answer is that process lives in the user namespace and it has all capabilities because that's, by definition, how things work for a new, the first process in a new user namespace. So the answer is, this process can change the host name. That'll succeed. Now suppose, instead, this process tries to bind a privileged network port, one of the ports less than 1024. To do that, you need to be privileged. Specifically, you need a capability capnet bind service. So, if this process tries to bind a privileged port, the kernel says, well, privileged ports, they are governed by network namespaces. Which network namespace does this process reside in? And the answer is, it lives in this one. And then the kernel says, well, which user namespace owns that network namespace? And the answer is the initial user namespace. And then the kernel's question is, what capabilities does this process have in that user namespace? And the first part of the answer is, this process has all capabilities, but it's not a member of that user namespace. So it doesn't have any capabilities in that user namespace. So it's not allowed to change the network, uh, the, the, uh, to, to do the privileged network operation, in this case, bind a privileged network port. Okay.
Now, there are APIs that you can use to discover these relationships between um, namespaces. I don't want to go into the details there. I've got a blog post about it. I've even got a nice little Go program that you can use to discover these, um, um, the, these relationships. All this code is on my website. The, the details are in the end slide. Uh, the slides are on, the, on my website as well. But the code is there. What I want to do is just then try this out with another live demo where I'll start with, again, a couple of shells in the initial user namespace. And up here, I'll say unshare-ur, um, so new user namespace with root mappings, new UTS namespace, run uh, a bash shell. Whoops, got to do that, of course, with um, Privilege. Uh, oh, end, end. Okay. Now, that shell's got a certain peer. Ten minutes, thank you. That shell's got a. Um, uh, a certain PID. Now down here I'm going to say um, go run, and I'll link you this also as super user, go run um, namespaces of dot go and then namespaces, just to keep life simple, I'm going to just list, show only certain namespaces. So I'll say, I want to see user namespaces, UTS namespaces, and just for illustration, let's say network, namesp uh, network namespaces as well. And I want to see them both for the shell that's in the new user namespace, and also for the shell down the bottom, which is in the initial user namespace. So I'll say show them for this shell and the initial user. Oh, this this shell, by the way, is in the in the bottom window. Is in the original initial user namespace and the initial UTS namespace. And I want to see the same details for um, the the shell in the top window. Okay, now what this display is telling me is there are two user namespaces here. This is the initial user namespace just here, and the indentation here is telling me this second user namespace is, is a child of the initial user namespace. And what I can see otherwise is there's a, a UTS namespace here, that UTS namespace is owned by the second user namespace. This is what the indentation is telling me. And there's also some network namespaces involved. There's uh, the initial network namespace, which is in, owned by the initial user namespace, the initial UTS namespace, which is also owned by the initial user namespace. Now, the um, PID of the shell in the bottom window, dollar, dollar there, that is um, 6318. So what we can see is that this shell the, in the bottom window is in the initial user namespace, it's in the initial network namespace, it's in the initial UTS namespace. Whereas the shell in the top window, it's in the new user namespace, it's in the new UTS namespace, but what you can see is it is still in the initial network namespace. Okay, I find uh, being able to visualize this stuff, which is why I wrote this program, saves you from a bit of insanity. Okay, um, so I will wrap up in just a couple of minutes. The, the, the thing about user namespaces is what they do is give the new process in the new user namespace, super user powers. And it's critical that those super user powers only operate in the new user namespace. That they can only do operations, that the privileged process can do, only do operations on resources that are governed by that user namespace. So there was the kernel developer concerned with all of this stuff spent um, about six years of his life 
bringing user namespaces to fruition. Because people were really scared. You know, if, if, if there's some way that this process that gets privileges could somehow use them outside the user namespace, that'd be really bad, and we don't want that to happen. Okay, but the thing is, user namespace implementation touched a heap of kernel code. And people were careful, they took, took a long time over it. But, you know, <coughs> excuse me, maybe there was some corner case that people missed. Okay, well, it turns out there were a few corner cases like this. There have been cases where somehow the privilege could leak out into the outside, into the initial user namespace, to let you do let a, an unprivileged user do privileged operations in the initial user namespace that they couldn't formally do. That there are very odd corner cases. Some of them are not very easy to actually exploit, but th they, they, the, these problems have been found. They have also been fixed. There haven't been so many of them lately. So perhaps, perhaps we've found and fixed most of the problems by now. That's, that's hope. The key point here is that user namespaces now allow um, privileged processes, oh, sorry, unprivileged users, to execute code paths in the kernel that formerly only super user could exercise. And there might have been problems with those code paths in the kernel, but you know, normal users couldn't try and test them out to see what can we break. But now they can. Okay, so why, why is all this stuff interesting? Why, why are user namespaces interesting? Well, they let us do a lot of interesting things. One is unprivileged containers. You know, run your Docker as an unprivileged user, not necessarily as a set user ID root program anymore, um, or run your LXC container likewise as an unprivileged user. But there's a bunch of other interesting use cases as well. For instance, Chrome used to do its sandboxing, set up its sandboxing for things like the renderer process using set UID root programs. Set UID root programs are always potentially dangerous things. If we can get rid of them somehow, it's a good thing. Well, nowadays, we can replace those set user ID root programs with the use of user namespaces to achieve the same result that is required for the sandboxing. Um, another interesting use case is a user namespace at the bottom there that has this UID map. Unprivileged ID maps to the same ID outside the namespace for a range of one. UID zero doesn't exist in this namespace. There can be no concept of a privileged process inside this namespace. From a security perspective, that's an interesting guarantee. You know that you can never get privilege escalation inside that user namespace because there is no concept of an elevated privilege because there is no UID zero. Um, you can do ch root style manipulations, but better with user namespaces. I won't try and go into that. If you know what fake root is, if you have a Debian background, well, you can do fake root, but without having to do the, the LD preload magic, you just create a new user namespace that has the required mappings. I won't try and go into the details there if you don't know what fake root is. But then there's a, a couple of other interesting programs that have appeared in the last few years as well, Firejail and Flatpak. I'm just curious, by the way, who's come across Firejail? How many people? OK. If it's getting to be more known. Flatpak? Wow, it really has lifted off. <laughs> OK, um, and the thing is, a lot of these namespaces, especially in the mid-2000s, were added with the container use case in mind. But each, user na each namespace type was in in implemented independently, and C groups were in implemented independently as well. And after, then, after people had done the container thing, people asked, oh, we can combine these features in different ways. And these are two really interesting use cases for combining these features to create completely different things. Not, we're not talking about containers anymore, we're talking about you know, generalized sandboxing of applications or redoing the way we package applications, which is what, of course, Flatpak does. Um, now, if you're interested in more information about namespaces, uh, I wrote an er a series of articles on uh, lwn.net a few years ago, which are still reasonably current. Uh, it's quite a long series of articles. 
It's also nowadays a reasonably decent set of manual pages, at least I like to think they're decent. Um, uh, and something that I didn't write, but I highly recommend, is a, a, a wonderful um, blog post by a woman in California, Lizzie Dixon, Linux containers in 500 lines of code. And um, I think she says at the top of something like, it's, it's 500 lines of code and 3,000 lines of explanation. Um, it's a very annotated listing of how do you do the container thing on Linux. And the point is, doing the container thing on Linux is, relatively speaking, simple. It doesn't require a lot of code to set up the namespaces, to set up the C groups, to set up the other bits and pieces that you need, to put a process in what we think of as being a container. And this is an annotated listing of those steps, really worth reading. Um, what makes container systems so complex, of course, is all the orchestration and so on that goes with them. Okay, and I'm done. And I don't know if there's time for any questions. Maybe one or two questions. Or you can break for lunch. <laughs> okay. Oh, please. You, that's not what C group namespaces are about. They're about virtualizing a certain set of path names. What I, I, do, I don't want to try and get into the details, but actually, C group namespaces are not about putting C groups into namespaces. They're about virtualizing path names. And the concept, once you dig down to it, once you know what C groups are, the concept of C group namespaces is super simple. Well, that was easy. <laughs> Down, down, down in the middle here. Yeah, so you said uh, you can create a user namespace by being a privileged process. Is there a way to limit that some... I want to just check what you said there at the beginning. Can you repeat the questions from the uh, start? Uh, you can create a user namespace as an unprivileged process. Yes. As an unprivileged, yep, as from an unprivileged process. Is yes. there a way to limit that somehow or like... Uh, so there's a couple of ways of doing this. Some kernels have, um, uh, 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 like the Debian kernel, for instance, disable user namespaces by default. And there's a, there's a, a proc file you can use to enable unprivileged user namespaces if you're, if you're, if you're a scaredy cat like that on Debian. <laughs> um, that, that's one way. There's also another mechanism where you can say, I want to limit the number of namespaces of each type that can be created. And I'll just say, go and read the namespaces manual page to find out more about that. But also, when you build your kernel, there are config operations, or config options that you can use to disable or enable each kind of namespace type. But, you know, yeah, thank you. you're saying goodbye to the brave new world when you do that. <laughs> OK, thank no you for else? coming along. Yep, thank you.